Ready to go over here? Okay. I declare open this hearing of the Senate Community Affairs Legislation Committee into the Social Security Administration Amendment Income Management to Cashless Debit Card Transition Bill 2019. Sorry about that. These are public proceedings and a Hansard transcript is being made. The hearing is also being broadcast via the internet. I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such action may be treated by the Senate as contempt. It is also contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The committee prefers all evidence to be given in public, although the committee may determine or agree to a request to have evidence heard in private session. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should state the ground upon which the objection is taken and the committee will determine whether it will insist on an answer, having regard to the ground which is claimed. If the committee determines to insist on an answer, a witness may request that the answer be given in camera. Such a request may also be made at any other time. The committee understands that all witnesses appearing today have been provided with information regarding parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses. Additional copies of this information can be obtained from the Secretariat. Finally, I ask everyone to check their mobile phones to ensure they are either switched off or turned to silent. Okay. I now welcome representatives from the Centre for Social Research and Methods, the School of Social Science University of Queensland, the Australian National University and Griffith University. Thank you for appearing before the committee today. Before we begin, could I ask you to please state your name and the capacity in which you appear for the benefit of the Hansard transcript. Dr. Rob Bray, Research Fellow, Australian National University. Uh, Professor Matthew Gray, Director, ANU Centre for Social Research and Methods. Dr. Michelle Petrie, Research Fellow in the School of Social Science at the University of Queensland. Uh, Janet Hunt, Associate Professor at the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research at the ANU. Dr Shelley Bielefeld at Griffith Law School and the Law Futures Centre at Griffith University. I'm a DECRA Research Fellow there. Thank you very much. So I now invite each of you to make a brief opening statement should you wish to do so and after that the committee members will ask you a few questions but did you have your, does everybody want to make an individual open, opening statement? Is that the plan? Matthew and I will make a joint statement and Matthew will give it. Then, thank you. Yeah, so thank you for the opportunity to appear tonight. And uh, as Dr. Brose just indicated, my opening statement is on behalf of both of us. Um, so as a way of background, we're academics at the Australian National University and we've both worked on a um, major evaluation of new income management in the Northern Territory undertaken between 2010 and 14, and have continued to monitor policy developments and the evaluation of income management policies. Uh, we have a background in economics and have worked extensively across a range of social policy fields and in quantitative data analysis and evaluation. We have a strong commitment to evidence-based policy. We consider that the evidence to support the proposals in the bill is lacking. In the explanatory statement, two sources are drawn upon to justify the policy, the AREMA evaluation and the Goldfields baseline study. It's important to assess the value of these for informing decisions on this policy. The AREMA study, while we can discuss in more detail the many problems with this, it is sufficient in our view simply to note the conclusion of the Auditor General and to quote, the approach to monitoring and evaluation was inadequate. As a consequence, it is difficult to conclude whether there has been a reduction in social harm and whether the card was a lower cost welfare quarantining approach. The second, the Goldfield study, is at this stage nothing more than a summary of some qualitative interviews undertaken and in the words of the report, at a time when the card had only been implemented for a few months. It is a study which contains no substantive evidence of outcomes, but rather various reports, views, opinions and perspectives of selected stakeholders and a small number of participants nominated by some of these stakeholders. This is scarcely an evidence base that ju which justifies the proposal. And our submission, we draw not just upon our evaluation of income management in the Northern Territory, but also the work of others, including Deloitte's evaluation of place-based income management, these studies have consistently found that broadly imposed income management has not resulted in improvements, including in terms of reduced substance abuse, uh, more effective financial management, reduced gambling or outcomes for children. These studies have not rejected the concept of income management as such, but rather have found that these policies, when applied broadly, not only have failed to achieve improved outcomes, but impose costs on individuals 
and risk increasing dependency, rather than boosting individual capacity and independence. In contrast, along with other research, such as the Cape York trial, they suggest there is some evidence to support a role for tightly and individually targeted use of income management, along with other supports for some individuals who have a demonstrated inability to manage as an option for individuals to choose to use if they're looking for an additional tool to assist them to manage. This differentiation is critical. Our submission has two attachments. Uh, one focuses on some of the issues of the two evaluations for the cashless debit card. The other extends some of the analysis presented in our evaluation of new income management to look at contemporary community level outcomes for the Indigenous population in the NT and the impacts of income management. This second paper finds that despite the fact that around one third of Indigenous people aged 15 years and over have been subject to income management for a decade, there have been no significant gains in child wellbeing, education, excessive alcohol consumption or crime. This is further evidence, we believe, of the failure of the mass implementation of this type of program. Finally, in looking at this data, we're aware that some of the statistics we use have been presented to the committee already, including the evidence presented by Professor Silburn on low birth weight. We note Senator Hughes speculated, and I quote from the draft Hansard, we also don't know if perhaps that low birth weight risk has been mitigated through better nutrition, as young children, perhaps through securing a better diet with more fruits and vegetables, have more basic needs met through the provision of essential services as part of that income managed quarantined welfare payment. In fact, we know much of the answer to this speculation, and unfortunately it is not positive. The question of changes in consumption associated with the Northern Territory Emergency Response and Income Management was looked at by Brindlecombe and others in an article published in the Medical Journal of Australia and reports, as with tobacco sales, income management had no apparent effect on fruit and vegetable sales. We looked at this question again over the latter period of new income management and reported in our evaluation firstly that fruit and vegetable sales were very low, in particular by people on basics card, and secondly that detailed analysis of sales and communities found there was no positive association between the level of income management and fruit and vegetable sales. We believe that, again, this highlights the importance of taking an evidence-based approach to this policy. In conclusion, we iterate our view that decisions on this bill should be based upon the evidence, not upon anecdotes, discredited study or speculation. More so, we consider that the evidence we have presented on outcomes in the Northern Territory calls for real policy response, not the continued implementation of failed programs. Thank you. Dr Petri, did you want to do an introductory Thank statement? You. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give evidence this evening. My testimony is based on in-depth interviews conducted between May and September this year with individuals on the cashless debit card at the Hinkler trial site. There are four main research findings that I'd like to bring to the committee's attention. In the interests of brevity, I'll simply state these now, but I'd welcome any questions that might allow me to expand on these points. So first, our findings indicate that the cashless debit card is making it considerably harder for many individuals to pay their bills and provide for their families. I'd particularly flag the issue of reduced housing security here, which we just published a peer-reviewed article about in the Australian Journal of Social Issues. Second, these payment issues have negative impacts on individuals' health and wellbeing, which in turn adversely affect their families. For example, participants in our study reported mental health problems such as anxiety, depression, panic attacks and OCD surrounding their inability to make bill payments on time. Strikingly, several individuals who had been in domestic violence situations in the past experienced the card as another form of violation and financial control. Third, significant stigma surrounds the card and this compounds these harms. Numerous interviewees had received disparaging comments from members of the public who had seen their cards. Uh, these were stories of ordinary Australians who had no history of substance abuse, who were being called junkies as they were just shopping for groceries to feed their children. Uh, and finally, this combination of issues, so that is the combination of reduced access to funds, emotional distress and social stigma, is causing some individuals to withdraw from participation in their communities which is concerning for a whole range of reasons, but it's particularly concerning because we have a lot of research that tells us that informal social networks are a key avenue through which unemployed people are actually able to find uh, job opportunities. The overwhelming finding here is that the cashless debit card is having a disabling rather than motivating impact in many welfare recipients' lives. And this raises grave concerns regarding the proposed extension of these trials and the expansion of this policy across the Northern Territory. I think we're all in this room because we do believe in evidence-based policy, 
The evidence from our study suggests that the cashless debit, debit card is not only failing to achieve some of its core objectives, but is actually making things a lot harder for some people. Uh, so thank you for your time, and as I mentioned, I'd really welcome the chance to speak more on any of these points. Thank you very much. Dr Hunt? Thank you very much, and thank you um, also for the opportunity to appear. Um, I have um, provided a written submission already, um, and my submission uh, focuses on three things. First of all, um, the need for a genuine partnership approach to solving the issues that the cashless debit card is meant to be addressing. This is what the Prime Minister agreed is necessary to closing the gap. So why is it not the right approach to use in the Northern Territory and in the three other sites in Western Australia and South Australia? Such an approach would start with the views of the affected people on what might work. It would not automatically start with a cashless debit card. Secondly, um, as previous uh, witnesses have uh, articulated, there isn't any robust evidence to support this extension of compulsory income management in existing sites and the transition from the basics card in the Northern Territory. In fact, notwithstanding its limitations, the Goldfields so-called baseline report makes quite clear that the cashless debit card is not suitable for certain people who are still covered by this bill, that is, those with mental health issues and those on disability pensions and their carers, <coughs> as well as those whose behaviours do not need to change because they're fine. And essentially, that report clearly indicated a case for much tighter targeting to those few people who have really problematic behaviours. That evidence from within the program itself has not been taken on board in this bill. On top of this, the evidence from over 10 years, I think it's nearly 12 now, of the basics card shows income management has made no discernible difference in the Northern Territory. So in my uh, opinion, and it's informed opinion, the evidence uh, sorry, a lot of public money has been wasted when it could have been spent on programs that actually work. The Prime Minister also said in his Closing the Gap speech this year that governments fail, and I'm quoting, governments fail when investment is poorly targeted and when we don't learn from evidence. Well, I think both of those things are the case with what's proposed in the current bill. It's poorly targeted and we haven't learnt from evidence. Finally, I've provided a range of alternative suggestions about what might work to make changes to these deep-seated social problems that we all want to see resolved. I've pointed to a range of research that has shown evidence of reducing harms such as violence and drug or alcohol abuse. The Maranguka Justice Reinvestment Project, for example, in Burke, recorded a 23% drop in police reported incidents of domestic violence and a 31% increase in year 12 student retention rates in just one year, 2016-17. So outcomes like this are possible with the right approach, and that is doing things with people, not to them. I've also made clear some principles for tackling drug and alcohol issues in Indigenous communities from expert sources. An intergovernmental committee that prepared an agreed government strategy and the Edith Cowan University's review of all the evidence. I'm sorry to say, but the cashless debit card does not conform to these principles. And it's for that reason that I really oppose this bill um, because I think it's a waste of public money. Thanks, Dr. Hunt. Dr. Bilford. 
I thank the committee for the invitation to appear here today. I'm part of a research project with Dr Michelle Petery on compulsory income management programs in Australia and New Zealand, which has multiple fieldwork sites. Our data analysis is still underway, and what Michelle and I present today are some preliminary findings relating to the Hinkler region where in-depth interviews were conducted with people who were put on the cashless debit card this year. Data from these interviews indicates that many people on the card have been experiencing a range of serious problems. People forced on the CDC and Hinkler have experienced a range of consumer problems, including failed CDC transaction experiences in various stores, failed BPAY attempts through Indu system, delayed payments through Indu system, and exclusion from purchases in cash-only settings. Many interviewees indicated that they had encountered consumer problems related to the purchase of everyday items that were not meant to be prohibited by the scheme. These include problems paying for needs such as groceries, prescription medicine from chemists, rent, petrol, transport, second-hand goods and insurance payments. Many parents also indicated that there was insufficient cash with the 20% to pay for necessary items for children such as tuck shop money, school uniforms, school photos, school holiday activities and tutoring for children. Some people experienced declined card transactions after eating a meal in a restaurant when they went to pay for meals, even when these meals had not included any alcohol purchases. Importantly, these problems show that the card does not operate with restrictions only on the cardholder's ability to use a proportion of their payment to purchase harmful goods as claimed by the government. The restrictions are far more extensive than that. The card creates a class of consumers who experience problems with day-to-day -day purchases that should be simple in a civilised society. Some people have had their limited incomes further reduced due to fees imposed with the CDC and INDU system. Some of these fees have been $10 each. These were fees that would not have been incurred if they had not been forced on the card. These fees make a big difference for people on the lowest incomes. Many people interviewed wanted to get off the card and had tried to get off the card but found the exemption process too difficult. There was also some confusion about what evidence would satisfy the government for the purposes of obtaining an exemption. And these problems indicate that a broad-based compulsory approach to the cashless debit card with an exemption system is going to be inadequate to meet the needs of Australia's lowest income people. I'm happy to take any further questions on these issues. Thank you very much, everyone, for those introductory comments. I will now see if Senator Seawert would like to start. Thank you. Yes, I've got um, some questions. Can I, hearing you say fees, can I go to the issue of fees first then? Um, can you explain the circumstances when, where fees have been charged? Like, I've, I've heard of it, but I haven't heard of the Specific circumstances, yeah. sure. So some of these relate to emergency transfer fees of $10. Some relate to late payment fees incurred because of in-due system that led to delayed payments. Some related to direct debits where something went wrong and then a $10 fee was imposed. And there were other fees that people mentioned too, so surcharge fees. So one person, for example, mentioned several failed transaction attempts with their CDC at a petrol station, and then when they checked their INDU statement online, they'd been charged 39 cents for each declined 
transaction. Uh -huh. Some people also mentioned other smaller fees, such as a dollar and three cents, some four dollars, some six dollars. So there were a range of different fees and charges that people had not anticipated. But the consequences for these for some people were quite serious. So one person encountered multiple $10 fees within a fortnight, and then that threw out their car payment, for example. So then their car payment yeah, yeah. was affected, and then their credit rating is consequently affected. Yeah. So this issue of fee charges is a significant one for people on the card. Sorry, Dr. Belfield, can I just clarify? Are you uh, quoting from a report that you provided to the committee? No, we'll be doing a submission to the committee on behalf of the, the group. We'll be putting that in to the committee by the end of the week. It's just that the statistics that you're raising are quite critical. So yeah. would they be included in that Yes, submission? I will include okay. those. And I'll also try to include a few quotes from some of our transcript data so you can okay. see a bit that, more That'd be really about useful. That. Can I, do you have copies of, because I've heard late charges before, you know, when you ask the government about do payments happen when they say they're going to happen. Yeah, NG's got a process, but I hear about late payments across the board. Mm. And it's, and so A, if you've got, you know, more evidence of that and screenshots and things like that in terms of then the fees as well. So people talk about fees. Mm. So if we can get screenshots or bank the, the statements that show it, that would be extremely helpful because again, I've heard about heard about it a lot, but actually getting mm. some hardcore evidence because obviously I keep getting told it's anecdotal, it's only anecdotal evidence. Mm. And as I'm critical of anecdotal evidence, particularly from the Arima report, it would be good to have. You know, some yes, I, I have actually thing. seen some of these you screenshots okay. myself personally. You have? Uh, I have. Yeah, okay. um, there is an issue in terms of confidentiality, protecting the anonymity yeah. of our research participants, which yes. was promised with yes. our study. Fair enough. So I would need to go back to those interviewees and ask for their permission. Take to their names off, I'm blank them out, totally. I'll go back to those interview participants yeah. and ask, I mean, that may mean that some of that data can't be provided by Friday, but I will try to ask those participants whether they would be willing to forward on evidence of that, further documentary yeah. evidence of that to the committee. But I can say to the committee, I have personally seen okay. a lot of these screenshots with these problems okay. over the period of time in the Hinkler region. Okay, it's been the trial's been going. Thank you. Um, just on in terms of then the the comments, I know I'm, we're going to run out of time, so I'm going to try and move around for some of the key things. Thank you very much for your your um, submissions and the and the submissions that are coming, um, Dr. Petrie. The can you talk us through the issue around the housing? Because again, this is an issue that I've heard come up mm. repeatedly in terms of difficulty in paying rent and things like that. So could you just expand on that a bit a bit further? Yeah, of course. So there are probably three things to mention around housing. The first is that the existing research, including government commissioned evaluations, indicates that these policies have failed to reduce homelessness. So there's no evidence that it's been effective in that space. Secondly, both our own research and research conducted by other scholars Highlights, highlights serious issues regarding um, people's ability to make rental payments. And some of that is around uh, what Shelley was just saying in terms of difficulties um, making payment transfers. And so people um, being able to pay their rent on time because um, they were trying to do that and the, uh, the payment was just bouncing back and not being able to go through. Um, in other cases, there were also individuals who were losing access to cheaper accommodation options because they didn't have enough cash to pay for these and those um, housing options were only available if they were able to pay in cash. Um, and I guess the third thing to note is that these policies also fail to address and may in fact compound some of the underlying causes of homelessness. So within the literature around um, the causes of homelessness, um, a lot of uh, research has been done 
around structural factors. So for instance, um, the availability of you know, enough properties. And so obviously this isn't a policy that uh, addresses that. But equally, the literature shows that there are some factors like social stigma that can make people more likely to become homeless. Um, and there is a lot of research around the stigmatising effects of income management and the cashless debit card. And so if the research is saying that uh, stigmatised populations, stigmatised individuals are more likely to end up homeless because they are more likely to be discriminated against in both the housing market and the labour market, that's obviously a really serious concern here as well. So do I... You probably saw the quizzical look on my yes, uh, face in terms yes. of stigma and the card and as a structural factor. Are you, mm. are you saying that the stigma of the card being on it may put off people um, who you're renting from, the, the, the property owners or the landlords? Is yeah. that what I understand so from your comment? Yes, there is um, academic literature that points to that as being a, a causal factor in, in homelessness and housing insecurity. But in addition, uh, quite a lot of the people that we spoke to explicitly expressed that concern. So they were worried that because they were having these problems paying their rent on time, that either they would, um, they would sort of be kicked out of their property or alternatively, that their lease wouldn't be renewed in the future because they were causing these problems. Right. Okay. And that was related to their contractual responsibilities to pay rent on time. So under Queensland legislation, that's a serious term of the contract. Oh, so that's okay. um, yeah, imposed on all uh, leasehold arrangements in, in Queensland. So for people who were periodically breaching their pay rent on time obligation under the contract, they were um, experiencing extreme stress in relation to that yeah. because that could lead to eviction. There was one person who talked about um, an, a party being evicted in their street because they kept having uh, a person being, not a party in the sense of they were having a great time, yeah, but yeah, you know, I, like a, a, a not person being evicted because the, they kept having problems with the rent bouncing back and rent payment issues and the landlord decided they didn't want to deal with it. That was like one of our interviewees had said that. But there were several others um, who indicated that these, these problems weren't teething problems either. They were quite persistent. So it's not like people were put on the card and uh, April and then by September everything was all lined out. Some of the people that are interviewed have still had ongoing uh, problems in relation to rental payments, either because the rent bounces back or because the INDU system um, with the rent payment, it, it, it exceeded the set threshold. Um, and like every 28 days they can transfer a certain amount but still wasn't enough to cover their rental obligation. Um, and some experience like the rent payment repeatedly not going through um, over, yeah, over a protracted period of time. So that was causing a significant amount of anxiety for people. Um, and some of the payments were delayed because of Indus delays in terms of sending that money on to where it was being paid to. So some people talked about two to three day delays, which then, again, made them breach their rental contracts. Thank you. Pass on to uh, Senator McCarthy. Okay. 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 All right. Th thank you, Chair. Uh, we've got limited time. There's a, there's a couple of questions I'd like to put to you, and if I can't get them answered, we'll maybe take them on notice. Um, thank you for your evidence here, uh, Professor Gray and, and Dr Bray. Um, clearly you've been working uh, in the Northern Territory for considerable time. W what I'd like to uh, get from both yourselves and, and some of the other uh, witnesses there is, uh, is there evidence that broad-based compulsory income management in the Northern Territory has worked to improve outcomes, any outcomes? And I need it for the record for Hansard, uh, just a response. The response is from all of the analysis I've done on all of the evaluations I'm aware of, there is no substantive evidence of there being any systematic improvements in outcomes in the Northern Territory, and in particular for the Indigenous population, where around a third of that population aged 15 years and over have been on that payment. What about 
Sorry, Dr Bray, what about evidence in relation to uh, families, women in particular, saying that it has worked for them in terms of protecting themselves and their children and families? Has anything like that come through in any of your evidence? There has been, once again, no systematic evidence on that. There is always some anecdotal evidence, but it's a balance of anecdotal evidence. So, for example, in the Northern Territory, we had people saying, yes, I was being humbugged a little bit less, but then the same people were saying, but I'm having to humbug others more because of the situation that I'm in on the basics card. So there are always these little bits which can be picked up by someone, but, and that's why I'm using the word systematic. There is no evidence overall this has, has had a big impact, so positive is, impact. Is there any evidence that income management works when it is more targeted and case managed? Our understanding is yes. Uh, Whereabouts, in what particular okay, situation? There, there are two, two elements here. Uh, one is the Cape York uh, welfare trial. Now, once again, one can't fully unpack whether that is just the income management element or the strong support that's actually given through the whole apparatus in that trial. But the two together appear to do something. Similarly, in the Northern Territory, when the uh, new income management was first introduced, they had a specific targeted program where the Centrelink social workers, who are fairly aware of who is really having problems, were able to put people on the scheme if they felt they were vulnerable and if they felt there were negative outcomes. Uh, having spoken with the social workers, all of them said it was useful. Okay. They all also said it didn't really do anything to address the key underlying problems that many of these people had, but in combination with other services, it meant at least some of these people were getting a meal each day. And that is a good positive outcome. Okay. But it's that tight targeting. Dr. Bray, we've heard um, we've heard evidence in relation to um, birth weights. Uh, can I just ask about uh, the issue of stillbirth? Have you had any evidence in relation to that with the research that uh, you've conducted? Not in the research that I've done. Uh, I've presented in the evidence the trend in child mortality, which is within the first year and the low birth weight, but not on the stillbirth issue specifically. Okay, could I just go to uh, the broad-based income management? Uh, does it uh, build capacity or strip it away? And that's an open question. Uh... The evidence that we collected says it strips it away. Uh, from that's everything from the anecdotal evidence of I can remember one uh, of the kids in North, in Alice Springs who responded, who had just finished school, and said I've I've learnt all of these things. I thought I'd be leaving school and becoming a responsible person, and no, I've had this imposed on me. On that side, through to all we looked at detailed data on whether or not people spent all of their income support money immediately they received it or whether they actually saved up bits of it and used it evenly across the fortnight. There was absolutely no evidence of income management changing the way in which people change, manage their money. If we, are, we asked a lot of the people who said they wanted to stay on income management, why? And the answer was, I'm used to it. It's, and it's easier to stay on. It makes my life easier. Easier to stay on because it's too hard to get off? A combination of easier to stay on because it's too hard to get off and a combination of it takes a lot of the decisions away from me that I don't have to make. All right. And we actually, this was something we saw a stripping away independence. Uh, we did consult in some of the communities on this, and 
the views was this was not always seen as a negative. There were in some communities they were saying, no, look, a lot of the people who are on it will remain on income, income support for most of their lives. And if it makes their life easier, that community was relaxed about that continuing, which Dr. of course it can under voluntary. Dr Hunt, did you want to just respond quickly? I just wanted to contrast that with the community capacity that's built mm. when you work in partnership. Um, and I think we've seen that with the Burke Social, um, the reinvestment uh, program, because that has built community capacity to analyse the whole life, life cycle and to look at the intervention points that they needed to look at in order to address the problems that they were trying to address. And I think that has built not just individual capacity, but community capacity, community governance, a whole range of things which will have long-term uh, benefits because that capacity has been built. Um, whereas what Dr Bray is saying, um, and I know reading his new income management report earlier, it's creating more dependence rather than creating people's ability to, you know, to solve their own problems and resolve, um, resolve community problems in the process. Okay, I'll, I'll just, I know uh, Senator Lambie is to, uh, has to ask questions too, just finally. Um, is income management in the Northern Territory racially discriminatory? I would say yes, yeah. as someone who does uh, human rights yeah. law. Yes, it is because there is indirect racial discrimination occurring because the program disproportionately impacts on Australia's first peoples more so than any other people in the country. And so there are still ongoing human rights violations with the cashless debit card. Should the cashless debit card be rolled out further in the Northern Territory, um, that is just going to continue to have that grossly uh, disproportionate impact on Indigenous people who make up at the last uh, publicly released data on income management, the income management summary data, close to 80% of the cohort who are income managed in the Northern Territory. And there is a body of scholarship that suggests engaging in racial discrimination against people has adverse health income, sorry, has adverse health impacts. And so that is, again, something that's inconsistent with the government's other policy objectives, the closing the gap objectives, for example, and things that they're trying to do to improve health outcomes mm. for First Peoples. Thank you. Okay. Senator Lambie. Ah, thank you, Chair. Um, I was just wondering... How many of you have actually lived on welfare? Me. How long did you... Do you mind if I ask how long you are on welfare for? Uh, as a, a teenager, I was on government income support um, due to it being unsafe to live at home. Um, and. That was for a period of years until I finished high school and then approximately a year after I finished high school as well. And then again, I had um, some government income support when I was at my first year of university. Okay. Um, how many participants have you got uh, signed up? How many participants are actually feeding back into your questions? <coughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sorry, I just, say, I just said that you, know, you all said we've had participants, we're hearing from them. So how many participants do you have that you're actually hearing from between the lot of you? Like how many participants? I mean, you're obviously getting feedback from mm. somewhere. So how many participa participants is it? Michelle, have you done the final data crunch on how many interviewees from each trial site? Because we've got a number of trial sites across two countries. So... Um, we're still analysing the broader data set. I mean, that is something perhaps we could get back to the committee on that. The Hinkler data set, we interviewed between us 30 people who were on social security payments who were affected by the car. Uh, these were in-depth interviews. Many of them went for an hour or more, uh, where we were able to ask a lot of probing questions in terms of people's experiences and what consequences flowed to them as a result of the things they were experiencing, the difficulties they were experiencing. 
And where did you get the participants from? Did you send out a call for participants or how, how did you line those participants uh, we up? We did. So we had a call for participants that went out through media. We did media up there that was TV media, newspaper media, social media. We also contacted various NGOs in the area. Um, I left any out, Michelle? Uh, no. Local job service providers. Yes as well. So there were a range of different organisations that we were contacting in terms of making sure that we got a representative sample for our Hinkler field work to make sure that the project was inclusive of a diverse range of experiences. And so how many people are on the Hinkler, on the Hinkler card at the moment uh, itself? Uh, uh, sorry, that's, uh, so you did Harvey Bay. Or did you do yeah. whole Hinkler? Is that Bundaberg? We did the whole Hinkler region. So you've done Bundaberg yep. and Harvey Bay. You did big media um, up there and whatever else. And was what you had 30 participants out of. Is it nearly 4,000 of them? That are, how many is on that card up there? Or 7,000 on the Hinkler? 7,000, I think. Six, and you had 30, 30 people that were interested in talking to. You. No, this was more. It wasn't that 30 people were interested in talking to us. It was until we reach saturation point with our data. So qualitative methods involve making sure that you interview a range of, of people and you get, uh, you, get you reach saturation data point when you keep hearing the same kind of experience over and over and over. So, yeah, I mean, Michelle might be able to explain that oh, really sorry, well just, as a sociologist. Yeah, 30 producers have been saturated and we've got 7,000 on there. So I'm just trying to explain yeah. what about the other 6,000 people that this might be working for, or six and a half. If you've saturated the area, told them to come forward, it's a little bit easy for me because I can stand out in the street, they all know who I am. So I can ask the same question. Yeah. I can see all the, you know, so for me, I can hit a heap of people at once over a two or three day mm, period. Mm. You should also actually mention that the study is ongoing. So we also have um, a large survey which is open at the moment. So we're hoping that we'll also have some of that more statistical data that will um, sort of feed into the study and... Um, in terms of quantitative research. Yes. Mm. Where, do I, where, where would I find a copy of that study? It's ongoing. So we're still undertaking the data collection for the quantitative component of our research study. And how long has it been in Hinkler for now, the rollout of the car? It was rolled out at the start of this year. So it was rolled out at the start of this year. You've been six months in and you, um, you're doing a study on it. Have you done any studies on Sejuna, uh, on the gold fields up the top at Kununurra? Have you done any of the studies up there as well and spread it out? Cause there are a number of field work sites. Sejuna uh, is one of the field work sites, but we have other field work sites as well. I can provide a little bit more detail uh, as to what the other field work sites are in the submission that we make to the committee, but it's important to stress that the data collection is um, you know, still underway in relation to the quantitative research and the data analysis for the qualitative research is still underway. So the, the points that Michelle and I are making today are in relation to the Hinkler region. Oh, OK. So you haven't yep. visited all the trial sites then? Have you physically members visited of, them? <laughs> members of the research team have been in a range of trial sites, including Sejuna and yeah, some other Do you know places. how many times they've been to Sejuna? I'd have to get back to you uh, um, about that because I didn't conduct those interviews. Great, that'd be great. And could you please provide me with exactly what, what communities they went out around Sejuna that is involved in that, that card? Would you be able to do that? Well, there's different communities, indigenous communities out there, obviously. Mm. Um, mm. For me, I've done now three or four trips back there in four mm -hmm. years, um, and I'm seeing a significant difference, and I'm not hearing what you people are hearing. That's very minimum. That's about 10%, and that's what I'm hearing. And I'll be going to Kununurra and the gold fields again shortly. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure what, what data you're gathering, but for me to stand out in the street and for me to go and see the non-for-profits and then go out to the communities, and I'm having a pretty good reaction to the reaction you're having. I've just got to work out why that is, because quite frankly, I'm talking to all walks of life out there. So um, you were saying about the housing, there's a housing issue. Where have you picked that up with, with the, the cards affected the housing? I'm sorry, I think that was you, Miss. 
Yeah. Is that true? I, I think that was what um, Dr. Bielefeld was describing before with respect to people encountering difficulties making their rental payments. And so that introducing a degree of um, insecurity into their housing arrangements as they were concerned that um, their leases would be terminated or not renewed because they weren't able to pay their rent on time because of those payment problems. Um, did they inform you in Harvey Bay there is a problem? Because we have some naughty people out there that do not want to declare to the tax man, and that's actually causing there's a shortage up there. I don't know if you know that. I've made that quite clear to the government. Um, but there is a housing shortage in that Hinkler area itself uh, for people that are on the welfare card because they actually mm -hmm. can't pay their money. So that's that's the only, and I can tell you, going all those trial sites, that's the only thing that I've heard about is that, and that was brought to me fairly quickly um, in what's going on in that area. And I actually had the coalition, I believe, looking at that, and they're actually saying, actually, we do have a problem with that. So I guess the tax man will be knocking at their door um, eventually. Um, you so have the, the sorry, uh, also um, you have the 50-50 in Cape York, it's 50, uh, 50-50, uh, so it's 50 cash, 50 um, thing. So you've got that in, in Cape York and you've also got that in the Northern Territory. Mm -hmm. Cape York Cape is Sorry. the discretion, different. I think, of the Family Relations Commission. There's a, that proportion can be adjusted. OK. I'll, oh, and, OK. Yeah, and I'd Thank also just mention very briefly the Northern Territory study. Uh, the surveys there were about 1,500 people hours of a population on incomes uh, management is about 14,000. And then when I talk about the data on, say, on the pattern suspending, the spending in stores, that was every transaction made in the Northern Territory on Basics Card. Every person who was on Basics Card, we had their records on the spending. So while Sometimes with the qualitative surveys, you're looking at quite small groups. Northern Territory was largely a quantitative one, and was very so. That was a, that's a big survey in Northern Territory. Tried to get 1,400 respondents across communities. Yeah, sure. So just quick, areas. where do I where do I get a copy of that survey? Sorry, that's my last question. Uh, Can I obtain that yeah, somewhere? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the links to the to evaluation reports. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a question on notice, or, or part one and two of it. Um, <laughs> this uh, bill will provide possibly for the Minister to have 100% uh, opportunity of, of quarantining at 100%. Uh, what's your response to that? And also, if it's done with community consultation, what form would that community consultation look like in your academic view? Yep, thank you. Okay, thank you. And I think Senator Hughes had a quick question yeah, as well. Yeah, just conscious of the time. Um, just coming back to the fee issue, I'm a little bit confused about that because the injury card is completely fee free. So, what I'm actually interested in, again, you might have to take this on notice, is uh, whether or not the fees that these people were being charged were being charged by the providers uh, as opposed to in due and the, and the cashless debit card because the debit card is actually fee free. So, um, well, and if it, if it was the providers, they would have been charged on any card. I've had some correspondence with the Department of Social Services mm -hmm. on this issue and was told this by the Department of Social Services, but I've seen a number of the screenshots. Okay, so maybe if you can include them in your submission, because that would be very helpful. I can't without violating the confidentiality of the people whose screenshots they are, because their can't account you, names But can't you, de them. you can delete the account names and include just the I would have to, as I data. said earlier, go back and ask interview participants well, I think whether it, it, they would be really willing really important for us to do that. Because the card is actually fee free. And so this is something that would be important for us to know that if fees are being charged as opposed <laughs> to being charged by the provider. As I explained earlier, there's a range of different issues with the fee. So one I mentioned direct debit. Mm. Um, and one of those, which I, I talked to someone from social, the Department of Social Services about this, one example of, of that is when someone set up a direct debit, there's delays processing the payment with the INDU and CDC system, the direct debit 
um, entity tries to take the money out, the money's not there, the person then gets a fee. Now this, you might say, oh, the card's fee free, but because someone's been forced on the card, they're put in a situation where they then end up incurring a fee they wouldn't otherwise end up with. So I've actually asked some of the participants who've experienced this, hey, have you brought this to the attention of the Department of Social Services? Because I think personally the government should be reimbursing people for all of these out-of-pocket costs because the government says this isn't taking money away from people, this scheme, it's really fantastic. But the interview data suggests it actually is leaving people with less money than some people with less money than they had to pay their bills mm -hmm. than previously. So, I mean, because we just, I mean, we need to clarify that the, you know, that the, the account had the money there when the direct debit was scheduled, that the fees were provided the people by... didn't... I guess, are they passing you over evidence to show that yeah. they didn't get my car payment till late in on the injury card, then I was penalised from the loan, the people that I loaned it from. I guess that's what we need to see. It's no good just putting it on Facebook, because I've seen some of the complaints that are going on those Facebook things, and some of them are absolute nonsense. So I really, what we need to see is not just the word, we actually, you need to see the evidence. You need to say, well, actually, we got overcharged here because it didn't go through on my injury card. It well, didn't I've, do the right I've said thing. that I have seen evidence of some charges that, you know, so. Like, and I guess the important I'll thing, to Dr. Dr. Belfort, to is that we need to see them yeah, too. Yeah, we need to see them. Um, can I just say, um, as a researcher, that there are quite strong ethical requirements mm -hmm. on researchers. So I don't think Dr. Belfort is being is being difficult. It, she genuinely has to be very careful about the confidentiality agreements that she's entered into in undertaking the research. No, but surely you can do, re redact. She can find a you way, can but... She can either redact, yeah, or if there if are these people, they can I'm come and talk to either Senator really? Lambie or myself okay. with the yeah, direct yeah. complaints. The business is doing the wrong thing. They need to be pulled up yeah. for it. Oh, yeah. Yes, and and right. you're more than welcome to refer the people to Senator Lambie or myself or anyone on the committee to, to look into it directly. I think that might be a better way, to be honest, because yeah. then it's up to them yeah. to yeah. pass on the information. It's not me trying to get from yeah, them something that we never said we would be getting from them in the project. So, like, I'm seeing some ethical issues I know, issues but it's just here, concerning because right? if we're getting it here as evidence, then mm. we need to be able to see the evidence. We can't just take it on hearsay. Mm. So if the evidence is there, it needs either to be brought to us or mm. by you or by them. Okay. Well, Thanks, thank you very much Chair. for that. Um, I, I'm very conscious of time. I yep. will have some written questions on notice, questions on notice. Um, so I'll make sure we get them through to you mm. ASAP. That would be great. And if I could just respond to Senator McCarthy's points um, that were made earlier. If there was the discretion to put the quarantine portion up to 100%, um, I think that's going to be really problematic based on the types of consumer problems that I've mentioned that arise for people because then they don't even have the small component of cash to be paying for what are legitimate expenses in a not quite cashless society that we're living in. Okay. And in terms of what type of consultation um, should be in, in evidence here, I was very concerned to read in the explanatory memorandum that it talks about the, the government giving people a say over how it's going to be implemented but not whether it will be implemented. So uh, consultation, at least human rights compliant consultation, involves free prior and informed consent. It doesn't involve telling people that they're going to be forced onto a program that they don't consent to. And I mean, that was something that came up in some of our interviews, people talking about the duress involved with this program, that they had been forced to activate their cards. They had no choice if they were going to pay, try and pay their bills, but to activate. That is coerced consent. That is not actually valid, legitimate consent. So I think in terms of consultation, it would need to be full, free, prior and informed consent that is human rights compliant under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Thank you. We've gone well and truly over time, but thank you very much. I've allowed it to go over because we've had a few extra people. So thank you very much for your evidence today. The committee will report to the Senate on Thursday the 7th of November and request that answers to questions taken on notice, which some of which will be provided to you in the next few days, are provided to the committee secretariat by close of business Monday the 28th of October and including your submission, which we're looking forward to receiving. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh, that's right. Right. Oh, some people got dinner, didn't they? Yeah. Um, <laughs> why, why do we resume five minutes? It's five minute warning. Where's the biscuits man? Where's the Tim Tam? Everybody ready? Hello. Okay, I now welcome representatives from the Department of Social Services and the Department of Human Services, Services Australia. Thank you for appearing before the committee today. I remind witnesses that the Senate has resolved that an officer of a Department of the Commonwealth or of a State shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy and shall be given reasonable opportunity to refer questions asked of the officer to superior officers or to a minister. This resolution prohibits only questions asking for opinions on matters of policy and does not preclude questions asking for explanations of policies or factual questions about when and how policies were adopted. Before we begin, could I ask each, you each to place, please state your name and the capacity in which you appear for the benefit of the Hansard transcript. We'll start on the left, Mr Gatton. Ben Galley, Director, Deduction and Confirmation Branch, Service Australia. Cherie Thorne, Acting National Manager, Deduction Confirmation Branch, Services Australia. Thanks. Rachel Goddard, Acting General Manager, Older Australians Division, uh, Department of Human Services, Services Australia. Liz Heffern, Deputy Secretary, Families and Communities, Department of Social Services. Tina Blewett, Communities Group, Department of Social Services. Selena Patrick, Branch Manager, Welfare Quarantining Branch. Thank you very much. Um, did you want, wish to make an opening statement? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to appear before this hearing. The Social Security Administration Amendment Income Management to Cashless Debit Card Transition Bill 2019 provides for the transition of income management participants in the Northern Territory and Cape York region in Queensland to the cashless debit card. The bill will also extend the current cashless debit card trial sites of Sejuna, East Kimberley, Goldfields and the Bundaberg Harvey Bay regions until 30th of June 2021 allow voluntary participants in the Bundaberg and Harvey Bay region and improve data sharing arrangements and the workability of the evaluation process. The cashless debit card is a debit card that allows for the purchase of all goods and services except for alcohol, gambling and some gift cards. It cannot be used to withdraw cash. The replacement of income management and the basics card with the cashless debit card will offer individuals a superior product while ensuring the continuation of a measure to help address welfare fueled drug and alcohol misuse and problem gambling. Examples of the improved technology of the cashless debit card include the ability to access online shopping and the ability to transfer funds between cashless debit card participants. The cashless debit card operates like a standard debit card and is accepted at all merchants that do not sell restricted items. This is in contrast to arrangements under income management where the basics card is only accepted at merchants that sell priority goods and enter agreements with Services Australia. The cashless debit card is accepted at more than 900,000 FPOS terminals nationwide, whereas the basics card is accepted at less than 17,000. 
We recognise the importance of supporting participants through this change, and the Department is committed to working with participants, communities and stakeholders to provide a smooth transition. The legislation has been designed to continue the policies supporting income management participants and ensure individuals and communities will experience minimum disruption through the change. Prior to the announcement of this measure in the 2019-20 budget, the Department engaged with some stakeholders and communities and is committed to continuing this engagement in the lead up and throughout the rollout in 2020. In our engagement to date, the Department has heard that the cashless debit card is a superior product that provides greater consumer choice and that it is important that the percentage of payment placed onto the card should remain the same as under income management. The bill provides that participants will transition at their existing rate. This is different to all other cashless debit card sites where 80% of a participant's payment is placed onto the card. The government has also allocated $17.5 million to support participants through the transition and fund support services across the regions. Should the bill pass, the department's focus will be working closely with Services Australia to ensure an effective rollout of the cashless debit card that minimises any disruption on participants. There will be a staggered rollout which will occur over a nine month period from April 2020. We will work with participants and stakeholders in communities and we are engaging now to hear feedback about how this process should work. The Department of Social Services, together with Services Australia, will hold community information sessions across the regions with participants prior to the introduction of the cashless debit card in their community. This will provide participants information about how the card works and answer any questions or concerns participants and stakeholders may have. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear tonight and we're happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Did you wish to make a statement as well or just, just no, a joint you. one? Okay. Uh, Senator Seward, we'll start. Thank you. Um, I've got a lot of questions, some of which are a bit technical. So if you say that's too technical, I'll just put down notice. Okay, some of them are quite technical. But first off, you know how you usually provide to estimates the list of um, the breakdown of income management, <laughs> uh, Ms Patrick's nodding at me, um, you, the ones that have for all of the trial sites and for the Northern Territory, how many are on, do you have that available tonight or should I just leave that till next week? Okay, um, I'm, I'm very keen to get uh, the latest the latest data on all the, on all the trial sites, but I'm particularly also keen to get an update on where we're up to with the exemption process. Um, you could perhaps provide us with some of that inf preliminary information now, and there may be some that you, you might want to do an enhanced report on for next week. So, Senator, you're talking about the exit process that was recently the legislated? Exit, yeah, yeah, well, it's exemption, exit, and, yes. and wellbeing, actually, the wellbeing, people that have come off due to wellbeing. Well, I might talk about the exit process first, if that's all right. Yes. And then I might pass to Ms Patrick or Ms Blewett to talk about the exemption process, yeah. which has been in place longer. So the exit process, um, as you're aware, the legislation that was originally passed was reworked a bit to make it... Um, yep. workable. Workable. Um, so after that legislation passed, we contacted all people who had rung and expressed interest. Has in anybody pursuing. been contacted? Uh, not everybody has responded. So we've done three, uh, up to three outbound okay. phone calls with everyone who uh, rang and said they were interested in pursuing an exit. And how many was that? That was? 1,415 1, people. 415? Yep. yep. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I beg your pardon. I just That's wanted to right. make sure I got that figure. I knew it was a, a, a it was over a thousand, but I didn't know. Yeah. So they've all been contacted. So and some, some haven't responded. Some haven't answered the three phone calls, and yep. so we're in the process. I think for those who haven't responded, of sending emails as well to try and get in touch with them. So we okay. have um, spoken to people about the need to fill out the application form. We've received um, around two hundred and fifty completed application forms. I'm just looking at Ms. Yep, Patrick, make sure right. my figures are right. Um, so we're now, um, Services Australia is now undertaking the process of 
working through those application forms and conducting interviews. Who's doing that? Sorry, Services Australia. Services Australia. Sorry, I thought you heard. I thought I heard census. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit um, odd. <laughs> so they're undertaking the interviews. Um, so they're all the applications are in different stages of okay. kind of completion. Has, I has anybody been? Come through the process either with a with a, an approval for a, for an exit or an, a rejection. We haven't got uh, to anyone to that stage yet, okay. but we anticipate shortly. We will. Okay. If you do by next week, could you break? Could you give us a breakdown of um, First Nations peoples? Uh, actually, overall, can you give us a breakdown of the 250 that you've received today? How many are First Nations and how many uh, are not? Yes, um, of the 250, actually there's 276, it looks like. Yeah. 26 of the applications were incomplete. So. 20. Oh, okay. So 250 we can act on. But of that 276 figure, uh, 66 were Indigenous, 210 non-Indigenous. What I strongly suspected would be the case because the form is so complex. Has any... Has anybody looked at that yet? The, um, Done any, you know, that's a vastly disproportionate number of First Nations peoples compared to the number of First Senator, Nations peoples on the card. Senator, I don't think that that ratio is any different from the phone calls we got about yeah. the exit. So before people had even seen the application form. Yeah, so, uh, so. of the 1,415 uh, yeah. people who had expressed an interest in exiting, uh, 576 of those people indicated an indige Indigenous status. Did they have to indicate? No. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, could you, if you could provide the breakdown for those, I won't do it now because we've got limited time, but against the, trial, the, the four trial sites? Yes. And did you want to... To talk about the wellbeing exemption process. Yes, please. Quickly. Oh, yeah. What trial site were you talking about those figures? Was that everyone? Sorry. It's that's everyone. all for all four 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 debit cards. Card yes. And have you had new applications since then? That those were the initial phone calls. Have you had more since the, the process is now clearer? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that we've had a look at whether everyone who has submitted a complete application had also indicated. Um, through the phone call process, that's something that I'd have to check. Okay, have you had more than the 1,415? I'd have to check that one. Okay, Sorry. that'd be great. If you could take it on notice and just then provide the figures against each of the trial sites, that'd be uh, appreciated. Wellbeing yes, exemption. Asked, uh, you're after an update on the numbers? Yes, please. So, uh, in Sedona, the number of participants who have been exempted through wellbeing uh, is 31. In the East Kimberley, it's 33. In the Goldfields, 95. In Bundaberg and Harvey Bay, it's seven, which brings us to a total of 100. Did you say seven? Seven, yes. How many have applied? To be uh, exempted the well under exemption. the wellbeing? Yeah. Uh, I would have to take that on notice. I don't have that in if, front If of you me. could take that on notice, that would be um, appreciated. Thank you. Uh, yeah, how many, how many had been applied? How many had applied? That would be um, appreciated. Thank you. Um, can... I'll follow that up again next week then for the more detailed, more detailed data. Can I go to one of the issues that came up and I've been getting emails about is whether the age, how the age pay pension is being treated. Can you, through the amendments, can you please provide us with what the process is and whether it's in or out? So. The, basically what we're aiming for is consistency with current policy settings in the basics card locations. Currently in the Northern Territory in Cape York, people in receipt of age pension can participate in yes. basics card, they can volunteer, they but they in. can also, if they have the care of dependent children, say, and are referred by a child protection authority or through some other referral mechanism. Or if they're vulnerable, do they, they come under that class of when the new, the changes were made of vulnerable people, do they come under that? I just, I think it's only where the authorities, where a relevant yeah. state it's just authority has okay. referred them. I'm just checking. So essentially we're mirroring those provisions. Okay. So 
uh, age pensioners will participate in the cashless debit card to the extent they wish to volunteer mm. or they're referred by the Family Responsibilities Commission or um, an That's NT in Cape authority. York. But yes, what about correct. an NT? So referred by an NT state authority. Okay. Could you take on notice how many people have been referred overall by an NT state authority and secondly, how many on an age pension? So, have, and thirdly, have people been referred not um, on, if they're on an age pension when they don't have children within their responsibility, they're not caring for children? Could be through the Ban Drinkers Register. Mm. Um, I'll just so uh, through voluntary vulnerable welfare payment recipients, child protection, and supporting people at risk measures. Sorry, and supporting people at risk measures. Yes. Yep. Yes. That's the yeah. Yep. That's the, the the other area. So it's just those. It's not extending the reach. No. Of the card. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I ask for an overall costs now? In terms of how much been has been spent. Um, so, Senator, we can give you the. Um, I might ask Ms. Blewett to just give you the costs of the um, the budget announcement. That might be. Yeah. So, in the 1920 budget, the, the government announced 128.8 million over the four years. Uh, so that's for this current piece of legislation. Um, so it's it moving income management participants onto the cash step card and also extending uh, the existing sites for another year. Um, it also covered that. some product enhancements oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, for the cashless debit card. Okay, I'm, I'm interested in over the whole time mm -hmm. that the cashless debit card has been operating, okay. um, have you got a global figure? Okay. So I've got in front of me here um, since 2015-16 um, over the four years to 2018-19, it's been a total of 50.367 million. And that covers everything? So that's card provider, evaluation, communications, departmental expenses as well. Okay, yeah. thank you. Then in terms of you add the 128.8 million, yes. if I added those two together, I'll get the cost. So yeah, the, the, that's right, the 128.8 million, that's for so over four years. Upwards from... of 180 million, or around 180 million. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. And how many participants? Oops, uh, Senator, just correct, but that um, one to 8.8, .8, that's from uh, the forward years going forward. So we haven't expensed that yet. The, yes, the yeah, oh, yeah, oh, I yeah. Take, okay. uh, yeah, 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 I take your sure. point. Yep. It's commitment. Um, mm. in, but that's the total amount going forward. forward. That's yes, what you're that's what I'm trying yeah. to get to. Yes. Up until the 50 point, uh, 50 yep. odd million, how many participants were um, co actually covered? Because you can, you should be able to give me. Yeah, we'll, we'll have that in another piece of data okay. somewhere. So the current participant numbers, sorry, I'm just getting the exact number. Mm -hmm. okay. You've got it? 11,547. 547. Yep. Thank you. And the project, I realise you can only give me the projected figures over the four years. How many people? So we're projecting about another 23,000. 23,000. So is that 23,000 the Northern Territory Basic Card recipients? Correct. And the Cape York. And the Cape York. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, last question. Sorry. Oh my goodness me, last question. <laughs> Sorry. I've got a whole lot of technical questions about what various bits <coughs> of the legislation um, mean. Can you come back to me? Yeah, we'll certainly yeah. if we have time. So yeah. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Does, uh, can people use the cashless debit card in the BPAY system? Yes, they can. Okay, for instance, paying rates or a power bill? Yes. Okay, so does the cashless debit card work for all BPAY merchants? As long as the merchant doesn't sell restricted items, um, then they would be able to use BPAY. 
Restricted items such as? Um, gambling, alcohol, or cash-like okay. cash products. products. Do you have a list of those? Like, are there, you obviously got a list of other things, is that, or are you just saying those three specific areas? Just those areas. Okay. Yeah. Um, are any billers with BPAY excluded from the cashless debit card system? And if so, which ones? I'm not sure. I'd have to take that on notice. Okay. Can people use BPAY to make a payment to a financial organisation like a bank? Yes. Does this include making payments on a credit card? I believe so. I would have to just confirm that, but yes. Okay. There are no restrictions on where credit cards are issued by banks work, are there? No. Does this mean that a person could wash their spending through a credit card if needed? And I'll just go through this again. Um, so I guess what you're trying to say, if you put alcohol on your credit card, then you pay that off on your credit card. Yeah, that's that's a good question. How does that work? So we would, uh, the department does um, you know, investigate um, where we think there is potential loopholes or circumvention of the card. Um, I'm not able to comment directly on uh, if anyone has done that via a credit card. So you have no experience of that at the moment or you've just got no solution to that kind of question or an answer? I don't think we've come across it, have we? Mm -hmm. Senator, what we're saying is that where there's a pattern of unusual transactions, we do investigate. Mm -hmm. um, we're just not aware that that particular instance has arisen, but other instances of unusual transactions have been investigated in the past. Like what, for example? Like uh, uh, consistently high rates of expenditure at a particular store that seems you know, one store in a community um, where, say, for example, where there were six news agents in the town and one, one is attracting 90% of the cashless debit card <coughs> traffic or something like that. And what, would, what was the answer to that then? What, what's wrong with that? With the merchant um, in making sure that they understood um, that if they were selling a good such as um, a cash-like product, that uh, we would engage with them to enter into a mixed merchant agreement whereby they agreed not to sell um, those products. Well, so I can go and get eight bottles of wine on my Visa card and you guys have got no idea and I just pay it off with my other card. Uh, OK, that's a new one. That's a beauty. All right. OK. Everyone will be getting Visa cards tomorrow. Well, there's some... <laughs> <laughs> it's to I'm just going to give some examples. Um, it... The Westpac low rate credit card, along with other cards, is advertised as having a low minimum income requirement of $15,000. This would allow people on DSP or parenting payment and many people on New Start to apply for the card and many people have cards before they're on New Start. In this context, uh, how do you know how many people are using credit cards to make purchases? Um, Senator, so you mean just a regular credit card? Mm. You don't. No, and yeah. I suppose it's, yeah. I think what I could say is that uh, if you wanted to make uh, transfers out of your cashless debit card to pay um, for something that, uh, what, that we could see was a, was a credit card payment, uh, we would ask for some evidence if it looked like there was a large amount of someone's welfare payment going directly to a credit card. Okay. In the Northern Territory at the moment, it's the basics card. Mm -hmm. um, are, is the Inju card in the Northern Territory at the moment? They're the cashless both, debit card? They're team? both um, Inju cards. So they're the provider. Sorry, what was that? Basics card is also provided by Inju. So yeah. they're both Inju cards. Um, the cashless debit card can be used anywhere nationally, um, provided the merchant doesn't sell restricted items. So yes, people can use the card. In the Northern Territory yes. currently? Yes. Yeah. And some people may have uh, moved outside of the trial site, so outside of Studio East Kimberley, Goldfields, Bundaberg, Harvey Bay, into the Northern Territory and they'd be able to use their card in the Northern Territory. So currently. how are you monitoring that use in the card now, or are you not? The use of the card in the Northern Territory? Um, we're not doing any active monitoring of whether people are using their cards. Um, but we can run reports yes. Yes. at any time. So if, they, so if someone from, say, Sejuna mm. is in Alice Springs with yep. their cashless debit card, you can see that that's occurring? We'd see that there was um, you know, purchases made with the cashless debit card. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
I, I asked you earlier just about what some of the restrictions are, and I'd just like to, you, you mentioned two or three things there. Um, the basics card does not allow the purchase of pornography, does it? No, it doesn't. No. But the cashless debit card does? Correct. So what is the policy rationale for this? Um, essentially, that's a, been a policy decision of government uh, informed by discussions that have been had with community representatives. Given that the intervention came into the Northern Territory 12 years ago based on uh, many things, including the use of pornography or access to it, do you see that there is a conflict with that policy? I think since 2007, pornography has changed a lot in the sense that, uh, as I understand it, there's a lot more accessibility to pornography without spending money than there perhaps was 12 years ago. So purchases of pornography are perhaps less of a relevant So is that factor. based on evidence data? No, that's, that's um, based on my observations. So based on your observation, there's People a... don't pay, pay. The trend data, as I understand it, is that people don't necessarily have to pay for pornography. So I'm just trying to understand this uh, policy because it is a critical one in terms of the Northern Territory. What evidence is there that the ban was ineffective then in the Northern Territory? I think that uh, we don't have any specific evidence um, that the ban was ineffective. It's just community views around access to pornography and the relevance of using a card, a restricted card to prevent access to pornography have changed and the government's taken on board those changes in community views and perspectives. And has that come through with conversations with the people of the Northern Territory, given that the issue of pornography was such a, a major issue in 2007? hence the basics card and the intervention. Has that come through in discussions with? I'll just ask Ms Blewett, she was involved in some discussions last sure. week. Yeah, in the discussions that I was involved in, in the Northern Territory last week, and I've also been up to Cairns to talk to people in relation to the Cape York sites, pornography has not come up, Senator, at all. The tobacco is the issue that's come up. It's not come up, but no. have you raised it? No, we've been very upfront about what the cash oh, so you've card asked can about do. The, you've asked about pornography as an issue, have you? No, I haven't asked about it as an issue. What we've done is when we've talked about the fact that we'll be swapping one card for another and the difference between the two cards, um, we've had an information sheet that we've handed out, and the information sheet tells you information about how the basics card works and what will be different under the cash as debit card. And on that information sheet, it actually lists that on the basics card, pornography and tobacco were restricted items, and on the cash as debit card, they will no longer be restricted items. OK, so people are aware of that then? Yes. And that's part of the flyer and information we've been um, handing out as well. But we'll continue to explore. Um, we're continuing to consult. Um, and it's a useful point for us to highlight, Senator. Um, so what, what communities and representatives were consulted about this, Ms Blewett, um, last um, week in the Northern Territory? I've got a list here somewhere. Look, last week I was in um, Darwin, Groot Island and Alice. Um, off the top of my head, we met with a range of uh, met with uh, members from the Tiwi Lounge Council. We've got a list of um, a, a that we can actually table. Schedule we can table for you. That yeah. would be great. Yeah. So we could give you that. That, yeah. that would be very quite an helpful. extensive list. And we're continuing to actually engage with uh, communities and representative groups. We've already started now, and we'll continue up until April when it's taken, and then through the actual rollout of it as well. The consultations will continue in the yes. Northern Territory up to yes. April. So, so I know, um, Ms Heffron Webb, you said it was your, in your expertise that's, that you sensed that pornography was not being used as much. But what expert advice was sought on that decision? Uh, none to my none. knowledge, thank okay. you. Okay. And were any communities uh, consulted prior to last week? Oh. That's me. That's me. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Excuse me. Can I put something on notice? I don't think I'm going to get back because this is going to go off and I'm not paired. Is there any way I could have a cost from the basics card and the injury card on how much the injury card itself has actually, how much we've paid it in the last 12 years? Can I get that, please? That'd be great. 
The costs of the injury card. Yeah, which the is the same card. people running the basics cards. Yep. They've been doing it for 12 years. I'd like a just a full amount of what it's cost us um, so far, if that's okay. Thank you so much for coming, guys. Sorry, I have to do a run. Thank you. I have leave, so I can stay, but I've, we haven't got quorum. <laughs> Are you right? Yeah. It's a core and we can keep going. Okay. And she'll, the others will come back too. Okay. Uh, that's just my pager. Uh -huh. Making sure. Do you want to keep going? Yes. So, um, just bear with. Just get my thoughts together. Um, so, just coming back to you, Ms Blewett, and I apologise, just got to get my thoughts, train of thoughts back together again. So you met in the Northern Territory last week. You met at Groot Island and Darwin, Tiwi Land Council, Annandilly Aqua Land Council, I imagine if you weren't, were on Groot Island. I just can't remember, there was a hot... Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, so, what, so you raised the access issue with the people you met. No one's raised with you any questions around that issue of pornography? No, no Senator. Okay. And uh, as I say, it's come up in the sense of us talking about what we're proposing to do and making sure because there were, were some um, um, uh, trying to do a bit of myth busting where people had said to us, oh, I understand you're rolling this out, you know, in other particular areas. So we're sort of just trying to get in with particular key leaders and community organisations and some of the access points to let them know what we're proposing to do and when it's starting and some of the key features of the card. Okay. So it was with that where it came up when we had to explain through the information sheet. So can the cashless debit card uh, be used to purchase online pornography? Well, I suppose technically it probably could. If it's not a restricted provider, um, then you can do online shopping. And it's a legal provider. So, it's a legal yeah, product. Yeah, a legal right. product. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just to confirm, there's been no um, policy rationale for that change. So, so Senator, it's actually not a. a sorry, to, just to help the. Basics card and the cash its debit card had two different policy drivers. Mm. So that's why the cash its debit card, as you would be aware, has been actually set up um, to test the um, um, around reduction in any social harm mm. that could be caused as a result of alcohol, gambling, you know, um, purchase of drugs. It actually hasn't been... The basics card was set up for a different purposes, so they've actually got two different policy intents. Sure. Look, I, I hear what you're saying, Ms Blewett, but for people who've been under a particular regime for 12 sure. years um, and were told that it was all evidence-based and now a decision's been made without any evidence mm. to change it, um, it's just very peculiar, that's all. Um, so can I just go to... Um, just on the uh, cashless debit card consultations that you've had, and I have asked this of previous witnesses, uh, in the bill, uh, the minister uh, has the potential of quarantining uh, up to 100%. Can you walk me through what that process would involve uh, if the minister were to go down that path? Uh, so the Minister will only vary the portion of payment that is placed onto the card in response to a request from the community. So it would be at the request of a community to increase um, from the 50% that most people in the Northern Territory are on to a larger quarantining amount. And what kind of form would that request take? Uh, we haven't yet um, gone through the, of the process of, of how that would need to um, be worked through with the minister, and that's something that we would look uh, at developing sort of in the future once we had some uh, legislation had passed. You've just met with people in the Northern Territory. Have you discussed it with them? We haven't had. Um, no, in any of the uh, engagements that I've had, Senator, no, haven't spoken about it. Is there any reason for that? Um, no, I suppose it's just been early engagement. It just hasn't come up. As I say, we've covered quite a lot of people in terms of talking to, and we've got ongoing enga engagements. The other thing, I suppose, um, while I note that this legislation provides for the minister, under the current legislation, the secretary already has a similar power, and that hasn't been exercised to date. 
I'm just, I'm just trying to understand, um, Ms Blewett, because people are currently on 50% of their income being quarantined. Are that, the conversations that you're having, are you talking about how much people's yeah. income will be quarantined? Yeah. Uh, yes, we have. So basically the, the conversations, the early conversations has been that because we're swapping one card for another, the, the, the amount of, uh, in, uh, the percentage of payment that's placed on your uh, card will be the percentage that's placed on your card when we um, swap the cards over. So, okay, so you're confirming that it's 50% to everyone who's turning up, is that what you're yeah, saying? If, if it's currently 50% on the 8th of April or, or thereafter, depending on when they transition over, that's what will be uh, actually um, put on the card. And what happens after that date? So then after that date, I think as Ms Patrick said, that if a community did happen to write to the Minister or write to the Department seeking that they wanted a change, then we'd have to consider it at the time and advise the Minister accordingly. If they wanted more than 50% quarantined? Yes. If a community right up to 100% quarantined? If a community sought that. So you haven't explained to them that it could actually go up to 100%? No, I haven't. Why is that? Don't you think that's important information to know? Well, Senator, the me meetings of some of them have been an hour or so, and it's about working through. I mean, the approach that I've tried to take is keeping it, I know it's a complex issue and I'm not underplaying it, playing mm. this, but it is about trying to actually keep things simple, trying to explain to people with the first principles of what we're proposing to do and recognising that we're coming back and doing a lot more detailed conversation. So mine were just early engagements, uh, looking for key leaders and community groups that we could access to actually go and talk to people in more detail. So we, it's, it's just been initial consultations and engagement. And what so was there? clarify one of the quick comments mm -hmm. before? We, in regard to the secretary current, currently having the option, is that on the basic card or the, the CDC? No, the, the, um, the cashless debit card yeah, or the yeah. basics card. So on the cashless debit cards in the trial side. Let me just check. Right. Just, just yeah, the CDC, the so CDC. There's, there's yes. nothing like that right. currently. Yeah. Okay, so. Sorry, you're, you're saying the ones moving from basics card to CDC? Is that no, I'm just trying to clarify yeah, because which they, card? they explained that the secretary currently already had the option to, to vary the amount and I just wanted to understand mm. which card it was on. So mm. that's and then after, what was the date you gave? The 8th of So April? the 8th of April is on the legislation in Cape York. Participants will transition over. Um, and then in Northern Territory, because we've got a greater number of them, 22,500 participants, we will start transitioning them over and do it by particular regions, which we're still working out, and we'll determine that by you know by engaging with communities. They'll transition from the 8th of April right through to December. Senator, December. it's not dissimilar to the process by which communities sought to participate in cashless debit card, as you know, um, various community leaders in the current trial sites wrote to government, sought access to government to ask that this be introduced. So we would envisage a similar process. We haven't nailed down what that process is. If in the course of consultation leading up to early next year, what a community says this is something we want to pursue at a higher rate, we'll of course um, uh, register that and consider how they might do that. But those are the circumstances in which that would come into play if a community sought to increase the rate. So can I just confirm then that um, after the 8th of April, uh, participants can be uh, quarantined from 50 to 80 to 100%? Only if the, could their community agrees and seeks that the rate be increased mm -hmm. and that is agreed then by the minister. Can they then go back down from 50, from 80, yes. 100%, yes. and yes. would they have to do that same process, which yes. are yet to work out what, what that will be? Yes. So that would be the community writing to the minister Initiating for it. one specific person, it's not for the, the whole community? No, it's for the community. No, it's for the, the whole, whole community. community. Okay. Can I just query, um, what, what about an NT resident who signs on to New Start after April 8th? What, what happens to them? They will go on, so in Northern Territory where, uh, apart from the place-based, it's 50%, they would go on 50%. Automatically? Yeah. Whatever the community, you know, so whatever the policy is in Northern Territory. I think, Senator, so, just, me? so there might be a transition period depending which community they're in. So oh, yes, say, for example, we roll out 
south to north, and I'm not saying that's decided. Yeah. And so it might be that we haven't rolled out in mm. their community. We won't be putting any new, the plan would be to not put any new participants onto income management mm. from January. 1 January next year. Mm -hmm. So when cashless debit card is rolled out in their community, they would then be placed on mm. cashless debit card. Right. Has a provider for the cashless debit card rollout in the Northern Territory been selected? No. When will the selection occur? Post the passage of legislation will commence the procurement process. So can you give us a time frame? You've given us a time frame of April 8 for when uh, the income quarantining will occur. So obviously we'll be aiming to uh, do it quickly once legislation has passed to be ready for April. And will it be an open tender? Uh, I don't know that we've made, uh, the ministers may not have made a decision about that yet. I don't think we have, we, have, we haven't briefed on that yet. So, all right, look, take the question on note if, if, if that's um, okay, Ms. Heffern Webb. Sure. So, will it be going to open tender or going straight to the existing provider? Well, I'll take that on notice. So. Um, so, in terms of the existing provider, uh, how does the government know that INJU is value for money? So the, um, the procurement of the card provider uh, has occurred a number of times over recent years. There's been um, proper processes put in place with due probity advice to ensure that um, the best possible value for money is being obtained for the Commonwealth. Um, that I might ask Ms Patrick to talk through yeah. those processes in a bit more detail. So the department uh, follows the Commonwealth procurement rules and all internal rules for procurements. Uh, before entering into any CDC contracts, the department um, has consulted broadly, contracted, contracted relevant experts and uh, conducted robust value for money assessments. Um, this has included um, independent probity advice uh, as well as uh, market research. And where is the Inju call centre based? Uh, in Brisbane. In Brisbane. Um, given the cost per participant is $2,000 per year in the four trial sites, what will it be across the Northern Territory? Isn't it 800 something? We, we don't have a, a cost um, for that procurement yet, as we haven't undertaken that activity. When do we are able to provide the uh, the cost of uh, Bundaberg and Harvey Bay cost for the card provider um, based on the maximum contract value for for the for the year, mm -hmm. but that is based on the maximum contract value, and that is eight hundred and twenty dollars per participant for Bundaberg and Harvey Bay. Eight hundred and twenty dollars mm. per participant. Yeah. Okay, yep. But you can't, you haven't got the Northern Territory. Estimates no, because we haven't yet done that procurement. Okay. Um, so, in terms of cashless debit cards, have any been delivered to communities in the Northern Territory ahead of the scheduled rollout next year? No, they have not. And w when is that expected to occur if the legislation goes through? So, if legislation. April. Yeah. Mm. April. Over, over a nine month period. One more question. Okay. Um, has the minister met with Inju in the last 12 months? Um, so, Minister Rustin has only been the minister since May, I believe, early June. Um, so, we'd have to go back and check whether I don't. My recollection is that she hasn't, but I, um, I could have to go back and check whether Minister Fletcher met with. Okay. Inju, if you could check Minister could Fletcher, Minister Rustin, they've met with. Sure. If the government's met with Inju in the last 12 months, how about that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Senator Hughes. Thank you, thank you, Chair. And I apologise if any of this has been covered while we were That's just right. in that division. Um, so we've heard testimony from a couple of witnesses um, about concerns around lack of consultation. And I was just wondering if you could update us on how many consultations in the different sites that the department did and who conducted those consultancies and give us a bit of an update on those. 
So, um, Senator, um, we've done extensive consultations in the four trial sites to date. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we have... I do have the numbers. I just need a moment to find <laughs> that. <laughs> Just out of interest, more than 30 people? Yes. Yeah, that's good to know. Yes, many more. Sorry. Um, so, uh, approximately there were 300 consultations held in the Sejuna region, 110 consultations held in East Kimberley, uh, in the Goldfields region between May and December 2017, 170 meetings with more than 300 people involving over 86 different organisations. Uh, in addition, more than 200 people attended 10 public community information sessions uh, between 21st of August and the 2nd of October 2017 in Kalgoorlie, Leonora, Laverton, Coolgardie, Kambalda and Norseman. Okay. And I'm just madly searching for Bundaberg, which seems to be missing. Let me check. And do you have an overview of the views that were expressed at those meetings? I don't have that with me. Maybe if you could take that on notice. That would be good. Sorry. I mean, Senator, fair to say that, um, you know, there, there's always a range of views expressed, but there has um, been consistent community support. Yeah. for the uh, introduction of the cashless debit card through those consultation mechanisms. Excellent. I think Senator Lambie expressed similar questions yeah. prior, previously, so unfortunately she's still stuck in the chamber. Um, okay, so maybe I'm very conscious of the time. Uh, you mentioned the $17.5 million support package. Could you maybe outline for us what that encompasses? So we um, are still working through mm -hmm. exactly how that will be allocated and part of this consultation process is seeking views from community about what would be the most effective and useful support services for them, mm -hmm. um, whether it's financial management services, um, whether it's um, access to brokerage, access to um, uh, you know, uh, alcohol, other drug services, etc. So um, we're really um, keen to hear what people in the Northern Territory and the Cape York uh, want to see and we'll then provide some advice to the Minister about the suggested allocation of those funds. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Just that I give you a chance. No, I had one. I did have oh. one for uh, DHS as well, since they've sat there so quietly. <laughs> <laughs> just, I uh, just wonder if you could talk us through how somebody going forward, if this if bill goes through and everything's all in place, how will somebody in the future be placed onto income management or the cashless debit card in the, say, in the Northern Territory or how, how would that, what would the process be? So I think uh, what will occur, so income management yeah. cashless oh, debit yeah. card are different yes, processes. Yeah. So in the future when it's cashless debit card throughout the Northern Territory and Cape York, um, it'll be a, a, a process where someone's identified as going on to the program. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, we, uh, for income management, we do an, um, an entry interview with someone and we talk them through what does that mean, what does that cover, um, what are the, how do you access your funds, how, uh, how do you access your balances online, those sorts of things. Uh, we envisage a similar sort of process for people uh, under the cashless debit card. Um, I'll just refer to my notes. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah, as, as I explained, it really is around how you know how does a card operate, um, how do you activate your card, uh, the role of the card provider versus the role of the department. Um, so service delivery will be transitioning through to D uh, to DHS or mm -hmm. Services Australia from January next year. So uh, we'll play an active role with the customers around that, um, and also um, certainly in the transition point, we'll be talking to them around the navigation of the card provider online portal as well. And so it's similar to what we are, where we are uh, in terms of that entry onto income management and the basics card. We are working with DSS at the moment and we will be uh, working with the card provider as well, of course, on exactly what that process looks like, um, both through transition and post-transition as well. 
So it will be a similar process to what currently happens with the basic card from the sound of that? Or will there be differences? I expect that there will be some differences, yeah. um, but I'm not in a position to give the detail of that at the moment because we are in the planning processes. Okay. okay. Yeah. No problem. One last chance for a final question yeah. before we close this. Okay. No Thank worries. You. Well, it is being 10 seconds before 8.15. Thank you very much for coming along today and providing your evidence. Um, there has been quite a few questions on notice and I do expect that um, we may have further um, questions on notice that will come from our senators that have had to leave. Um, the committee will report to the Senate on Thursday the 7th of November and request that answers to questions taken on notice are provided to the Secretariat by the close of business Monday the 28th of October. Obviously in the meantime we will have um, estimates so you may find that uh, a lot of the questions are asked again then. So that concludes today's hearing. On behalf of the committee, I would like to thank all those who have made submissions to the inquiry and made representatives available today. I would also like to thank the Hansard, Broadcasting and Secretariat staff for their assistance today. The committee stands adjourned. Thank, thank you. you.